Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really sorry that uh, I can't be there today in Edinburgh. Um, it's a great shame. Um, but um, I, I suppose this is this is second best. So it's it's good to have the opportunity to present uh, the beginning of this session and also uh, this this paper um, remotely. So thank you uh, to the organizers for uh, arranging this. And um, thanks especially to Steph, who's um, who's stepped in uh, at uh, at the last minute to chair the session live. I hope it's going well um, at the conference. And um, yeah, I wish I was. I wish I was there. Um, uh, the, the session today um, is is quite wide ranging, um, consisting of. Um, uh, a range of views on um, archaeology and uh, its uh, its insights um, into aspects of, of climate change. Originally, um, we had uh, hoped that the session would be a kind of taster for next year's tag, which will take place in um, in Norwich at um, at UEA, um, and uh, we're really looking forward to that. And the theme of that tag will be will be climate. And archaeology. So we hope to see many of you there uh, next year. Hopefully the weather will be better and hopefully the um, public transport will be working. Anyway, without um, further ado, I'll move on to my paper today, which is um, entitled The Long Roots of Clim the Climate Crisis, an Archaeological Perspective on the Causes of Climate Change. And um, it takes as its um, starting point the work of uh, the existential philosopher, German philosopher Karl Jaspers, who um, in 1952 wrote a book called The Origin and Goal of History, in which he describes an axial age that took place between around 800 BCE through to about 200 BCE. Um, and uh, during that time, uh, a range of new religious, philosophical, social and material ideas uh, appeared in um, certain parts of Eurasia. Jaspers believed that these transformations happened separately and in isolation. Archaeology, I think, suggests otherwise. Jaspers points to religious leaders and thinkers such as Confucius, um, Buddha, Zarathustra, Elijah, Homer and Plato, who were all broadly of this period of time. Um, but the social conditions for development of the ideas associated with these thinkers, um, I think archaeology would argue, had a much longer time depth. Um, I've also drawn on the work of, of, the, uh, of the anthropologist David Graeber, uh, who sadly passed away uh, just a few years ago. Uh, in his um, 2011 book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, uh, he built on Jasper's framework um, and followed other scholars such as Richard Seaforth in making a link between religion, philosophy and the appearance of cash money and by extension, formalized markets. And also influential uh, and separately uh, are Donna Haraway and Bruno Latour uh, on, on my thinking, who both argue for a re-evaluation of assumptions regarding the relationship of humans with the planet. So do we need a better archeological narrative providing a framework for why we are, along with all the other creatures on Earth, uh, Haraway actually uses this, the terms critters, facing an existential crisis. Um, does ar the archaeology, sorry, does the Axial Age make sense from an archaeological perspective then? There's an apparent link between cash money and a change in the way that exchange was conceptualized. The chronology for this is debatable, but may be linked to a series of changes dating back into the Bronze Age. 
Graeber suggests that a military coinage slavery complex developed in many parts of Eurasia in the, in the mid first century BCE. How would we recognize this archaeologically, particularly in places that did not possess writing at the time? Well, coinage may be one way of seeing the change, but there are possibly others which I will come on to uh, in a little bit. Uh, is monetized exchange linked to stronger ideas relating to the self and hence to the religious and philosophical changes witnessed in the first millennium BCE? some of which were a reaction to a, an increased concept of self, and presented by Jaspers as the Axial Age. Are the roots of these changes actually older, and do they relate therefore just as well to parts of the Bronze Age? Um, for example, um, have a look at the work of Ilongo and Largo, uh, who recently have um, looked at the small change revolution, as they call it, weight systems and the emergence of the first pan-European money, and you can find that in the Journal of Archaeological Sciences. So I think the Axial Age can be used as a framework or a, a, a heuristic device. Graeber builds on the work of Richard Seaford, as I said, See, for instance, the origins of philosophy in ancient Greece and ancient India, uh, recently published, who postulates a key relationship between the development of monetization and Greek and Indian schools of philosophy linked to the self and hence to um, transcendence. The concept of coinage spreads relatively rapidly across Eurasia from around 600 BCE, arriving, for instance, in Britain by 250 BCE. Though it doesn't get to everywhere, some societies uh, seem to resist these concepts. For example, um, prehistoric Japan in the, in the Yayoi period. The earliest known mint currently uh, is at Guanzhuang in the eastern Zhao, Zhao, dated to around 640 to 550 BCE. Uh, and you can read about that in uh, antiquity, radiocarbon dating, an early minting site, the emergence of standardized coinage in China. So what can archaeology add to our understanding of these changes in the first millennium BCE? And what does this have to do with climate change? Well, archaeology provides a universal view rather than um, a historically specific one. A key point of contention with Jaspers is the idea that the axial elements arose in isolation from each other. Archaeology, I think, shows this to be false. It's probably more realistic to look at Eurasia as a vast area of movement and exchange at this time. Archaeologically, we can see the connections between the axial locations and how ideas, material, and of course, people moved across large distances in Eurasia. The other insight that archaeology can provide is the link between material and mind. Technologies and our engagement with them alter the way that we think. Seeing the natural world as a set of resources different from the human or cultural may be linked to conceptualizations of the self. Therefore, does the nature-culture divide have its origins in these changes? And for theoretical, um, a theoretical framework, I've drawn on the work of, of several uh, scholars in archaeology and, and beyond. Uh, this is just a, 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 a small list of um, some of those uh, some of those publications. Um, Lambros Malaforis uh, draws on the work of Merleau-Ponty and Carl Polyani, using the example of the blind man's stick as a method of illustrating the ontological meshing of the human brain and the material world mind emerges from the synthesis of the two. 
Here, in looking at the develop development of new materials such as metal objects and, and later coinage, the mind-altering nature of these new ways of engaging is perhaps underestimated. A transformative technology like bronze working begins an alteration of the manner in which the world is perceived. Coinage too, accordingly, stretches the way in which relationships with both other people and the environment are conceptualised. Ian Hodder, uh, in his um, 2012 work, Entangled, um, discusses the conceptualization of the term entanglement, utilizing the work of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guitari, who discuss moving away from hierarchical classification systems, rather emphasizing the link that links that flow among entities, instead searching for the origin, instead of searching for the origins of hierarchies and causes, they urge a focus on the complex ways in which things are caught in webs. Hodder also draws on the work of Marilyn Strathern, who described enchained or distributed personhood. Here she was looking at Polynesian and Melanesian cultures in which persons are individual or partible persons, meaning that they are products of chains of social actions with no division between social and individual persona. Tim Taylor in The Artificial Ape suggests that humans have, since at least Homo erectus, been technologically constituted, arguing that this is an essential aspect of being human. In some ways, the concept of technology is perhaps better suited to a description of the person-thing interface and the transformative nature of new materials or technologies. This may be particularly the case with metal production, for instance. What I'm also interested in here are the byproducts of metal production, so standardized weights and measures, and how they too might end up altering the minds of those who utilize them. Uh, Chris Fowler, in a number of works, has uh, and, and others too, have explored these themes, based to a large extent again on the work of Marilyn Strathern, examining tensions between individual and individual persons. Marshall Salins argues that kinship rather than personhood is a better term for understanding social relations in most societies. In societies where kinship links are strong, the concept of kin often extends to other living beings in addition to people. Personhood goes beyond the human and encompasses animals and places. Another way of seeing long distance connections and hence the spread of concepts across vast stretches of Eurasia in this period is via visual culture. Recent scholarship has emphasized the relationship between art styles across Eurasia. In Central and Western Eurasia, for instance, the styles referred to as Celtic and Scythian seem to show clear relationships with each other as well as distinct differences. O'Sullivan and Hommel suggest that both styles can be viewed as representing similarities in cosmologies that can be charted across northern Eurasia from the Bronze Age and throughout the Iron Age. These cosmologies were contextually embedded in environments and depict animals, composites of different animals, and perhaps combinations of animals and humans, sometimes in the process of transformation. Their work draws on that of David Wengrow, who has posited that the distribution of prehistoric iconography indicates that composite animal figures, or monsters, as we could call them, before the urban revolution of the fourth, century, the fourth millennium BCE, were scarce, and that their subsequent geographical movement shows a selective and highly patterned trajectory of expansion. 
In a sense, it's a package of concepts that were exchanged with the art, a, comp a component that in the case of Mesopotamia and Egypt included administrative technologies such as clay tablets and cylinder seals. Arguably, these plastic technologies, which included bronze casting, were key in these contexts for transforming towards a market orientation and later developed into other transactional technologies, such as coinage. Returning to David Graeber and by extension Carl Jaspers, slavery in the sense of ownership of another person probably didn't exist prior to the advent of money, although there would have been uh, inequalities and people would have had um, service obligations. Long distance slavery may not have existed until coinage. Religions such as Buddhism and Christianity, along with um, philosophical schools of thought, such as those led by Confucius and Plato, in Graeber's theory, were a reaction in part to mar the market mindset. By extension, these changes also represented a move away from animistic beliefs and therefore a connection or deep connection to the environment. So abstract ideas are linked to material culture. In this case, the concept of cash, property and the self are all linked. Money is made possible by and promotes the development of individual property. Gold and silver as a means of exchange are also key in, the rit in ritual sacrifices, as are bronzes. The metals as mediums for exchange um, begin as specific weight, begin uh, uh, as, as just metals and as specific weights, and later are codified into coinage. Markets lead to a particular form of exchange that objectifies living beings, including people. So the Axial Age can be viewed as a, an early example of uh, globalization. 20 years after Jaspers published The Origins and Goals of History, Emmanuel Wallerstein considered the origin and trajectory of capital, capitalist agriculture. Wallerstein's thesis clearly has implications for the current dominant global social structure, market capitalism, and indeed for the manner of the discourse on that subject in terms of historical economics, which is often framed um, within particular terms um, when discussing the long durée. So to, to wrap up, um, drawing on these threads uh, together and drawing these threads together and returning to the issues examined at the beginning of the paper, how can archaeology inquire into the concept of the axial age and what implications does it have for understanding the long roots of climate change? The answer may be in scope and time depth. If materialism sits at the center of the changes and the ramifications for concepts of the self, we can see the potential depth of some of these ideas further back into prehistory. Graeber, following Seaford, suggests that cash money is a key change in the way that people relate to their worlds. Changes in religion and philosophy during the middle of the first millennium BCE coincide with this innovation. What happens when these ideas and materials reach new populations? Adaptation is forced, take up and resistance being two possible responses, along with new, the forging of new ideas. And David Graeber suggests that there is a dehumanization of exchange with markets making it possible to treat kin as strangers and making slavery uh, a more commodified possibility. And indeed, not only are people um, commodified, but the whole of the environment is. Many thanks for listening. Um, and um, I'll uh, hand back over to Steph. Thanks again. Cheers.